Welcome to the future. Uh, no, not the temporal state of being, but rather the television program of the same name. It explores the relationships between art and technology. So come, converge with us as we send yet more information out into the ether. Um, first item. Nigel, you out there? Yeah. Uh, what's your first item, please? I got a piece on the future of computer graphics. I talked to the co-chairs of last year's SIGGRAPH, the major computer graphics conference, about this amazing uh, art form and where it's taking us in, in the uh, not-so-distant future. Okay, what else you got? I, I, well, in fact, I got to go edit it now. So uh, I left your message on your computer. Why don't you check okay, there? Okay, will do. Frank Ogden is a futurist who's in love with change and who collects gigabytes of information on his, uh, his electronic houseboat in Vancouver. What he doesn't like very much is the book, even though he's just published one. He says the book is doomed, and the future is the electronic book. For my next item, click over here. Men may dominate the computer world, but feminist artists are getting online. Matrix Women Networking is a project in which female artists are using computer networks to collaborate. Right. Stand by then for the future. Computer graphics have really um, become overwhelming in these last couple of years. The amount, the sheer volume of technically produced images affects almost everyone on the planet. There are um, people in every walk of life that see them. There are many people that don't even recognize them as, as technically produced. I think that, the re that one of the reasons why they are interesting and one of the reasons why we see so much of them is that they um, are using the technology of the day. We've seen that at every point in history. You know, daguerreotypes were a fad and they really, um, they sold 9,000 the first year they were out, kits to make daguerreotypes. Um, and, and now, computer graphics is the, the medium and it is the, the visual language of our culture. You know, we've gone from um, prints to pr photographs to the moving image, the cinema, television and now we're into the digital age with computers and I think that their influence will continue and the, their imp the importance of technically produced images will um, go on for quite some time. A hundred and thirty, hundred and fifty years ago, uh, photography was a new technology and people were sort of fascinated by it, but they didn't really learn how to understand it and how to use it. Uh, I think we're in that phase, that early phase, of understanding and utilizing this technology called computer graphics. And the, uh, the next step is to make it a commodity where everyone can have access to it and can use it and, uh, uh, and apply it to their problem and helping them gain better understanding in the, the information or whatever their, uh, whatever their world brings them. Computer graphics has had um, a very a strong influence on the traditional arts. Um, certainly all of the graphic arts have changed. There's now, there are now ways to make images using computers 
with much higher precision and much greater fidelity than had been able we've been able to do before. And the fine arts, computers have had an impact because now we are moving away from the notion of the object. And I think that that's a really um, kind of a staggering concept because the art world as we know it is built on the concept that objects are unique and precious. With computer graphics, we have objects that are essentially infinitely replicable. And so it's hard to determine how much they're, how, what's their value. What is the value of a, of a digital copy that happens to be the exact copy of the original? I think that that's uh, something that we'll be, we'll be uh, debating and, and working with for quite some time. I think the future of computer graphics principally is to continue along this uh, ability to create images, to create images of places where you've never been, to see things that you've never been able to see. Uh, scientists and engineers use computer graphics to visualize information um, that there's no other way to process that information. The computer simulations that they run uh, turn out m millions, billions of numbers. And it's very hard to look at uh, a billion numbers and understand what it represents. But by creating a picture, uh, they're able to actually see things. And then when you animate those pictures, new information comes out. And the scientists and engineers that use scientific visualization and computer graphics techniques have been able to actually gain insight into the science that they're developing, as well as their models. I think one of the innovations that's coming in computer graphics is the advent of a computer behind every single pixel on the screen and probably some more to boot in the memory. Um, we'll have uh, many processors calculating images. They'll each have their own little bit of intelligence and their own amount of memory. And I think we'll see massively parallel, massively connected computers that will be able to start to work at the level of our own visual system. We'll start to approximate that. Probably the, um, the biggest innovation in computer graphics in the future is uh, the fact that it's becoming much more affordable to a wi much wider audience. Uh, the tools are becoming readily available. You can buy uh, very powerful graphics tools to run on a Macintosh or an IBM PC computer. Uh, people are able to make film and, and, and go through this creative process of making an animated film. Uh, and they can do that on a very low budget in their home. And I think that's part of the revolution, is, 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 is uh, bringing this technology to a much wider base and making it much more affordable. My name is Scratch, see, I'm a plague with a PhD, not renewing the earth is my psychology. I'm bopping while I'm chopping and I'm pouring all the toxin in the air, the soil and the sea. I make the soil worthless and I boil the seeds with my logging and my mining and my CFCs. I'm going to till it and fill it and practically kill it through my plan. You kids will be earthless, 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 earthless. I don't really worry much about um, the effect of these images on the population. I think that there's a great tendency for people to see themselves as victims of technology that's happened at every point in the process. There are people that thought they were victims of the, you know, monks thought they were victims of the printing press because their, their job of illuminating manuscripts and, and copying the known, uh, the, the, the body of knowledge of the day suddenly vanished. It's suddenly out of control. The, um, and I think that there will always be changes. There will be, the world will not be the same because of these images because of this way of working, but it won't be, uh, it, it, I think it's, it's neutral, it's a neutral situation, and, and people will make it positive and negative, as we do with many, any other technology or any other technique. Matrix Women Networking arose one day when Lucia Grossberger and I were talking about various interesting online projects that we knew of, and suddenly we realized that they were all being done by women. It was very interesting to us that the online population is predominantly male on most systems, including the internet, 
there's something like under 15% of women around the world that are online. So we wanted to show some of the collaborative and interactive projects that our women are doing for empowerment and kind of changing the hierarchical nature of how our society is structured. Matrix is, I, I, is a really fascinating word. Um, the first time I really noticed it, uh, there was a women, women's magazine in Santa Cruz named Matrix. And then uh, there's, of course, Matrix Algebra. And then in Neuromancer, William Gibson's book about cyberspace, he also used the word matrix. So I went into Oxford Dictionary and started looking it up. And the archaic meaning of matrix is womb. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. So it was, um, so matrix is like a malleable structure that can expand or contract and it's flexible and it's, and I thought this is kind of, this felt really, uh, it seems like the network and it also felt very feminine. That was why I liked the word. One of the stories that I've heard about students using computer networks or using computers in the schools around high school level is that girls really adapt quickly to electronic mail and news groups and boys like to play computer games. Women in our culture anyway are trained to be nurturing, to interact with people, to collaborate and cooperate and that seems to translate very well in an online structure. I think women tend to like to communicate with each other by phone and I think in many ways electronic mail is really an extension of the telephone. I think computer networks are important to women artists because of the isolation, uh, isolation in which most uh, artists work in, uh, particularly women artists who don't have strong communities. Well, once you're out of graduate school uh, or if you're not teaching in a university environment, you have a tendency to be um, stuck in your studio. So the opportunity to speak online with other women artists to, or other artists in general uh, across a variety of different cultural experiences uh, I think is very essential. You need the input of uh, of uh, new ideas, of new perspectives. Uh, it helps your own work and it empowers you as well as the community that you serve. I think the most exciting part to me for women is because women do like to collaborate. It gives us a real opportunity to collaborate and still sustain our own individual interests. Like if uh, you're working on a piece, you still have your part that you added to it, that you participated in, and you can still uh, collaborate with other women and put the piece together. In a, it's, it's, it becomes a... Um, I think there's times when it really becomes an exciting experience when you collaborate and there's a group mind and I think that's the type of thing that I'm really looking forward to seeing. And I think that women are probably have an easier time. I'm not really totally sure all the reasons, maybe because we're taught more to collaborate, to work with others, to be more nurturing. But I think that I, a lot of the exciting things that I see in collaboration right now in the computer graphics world are being done by women. And this has been pointed out by several people that it just, it seems to be in our nature to want to do those types of projects. And I think the, the computer and the networks are an incredible vehicle to allow us to explore those in different ways. And I really don't know what's going to happen. It's exciting. In terms of demographics, there tend to be mostly white people online and they tend to be Americans and people that come from different cultures with different communication styles also often feel as though they're not a part of the system. I, one person that I work with is Native American and he tends not to participate in public conferences but rather to send email and that's a culturally bound communication style. I found that as, a, as an artist, as a Chicana artist especially, that the computer offers uh, a way of organizing communities, especially disenfranchised communities, uh, it it uh, allows for people who would not normally have access to information or to um, power structures such as a city council. It affords them that opportunity and I think that it's going to be um, an important organizing tool for the future. Uh, the problem of course becomes access. Who has access to this technology and expanding the access into uh, immigrant communities, um, into Latino communities, into the working, in, into, into the neighborhood of the working poor is going to be um, a big challenge, a, a big challenge for artists and community arts activists. Currently, I'm not sure if there's really any advantages for women of different cultures or of different uh, colors, um, because I find the network's pretty hard to deal with, honestly, and I, I would, I'm sometimes almost even intimidated showing other people how to use them, other women how to use them. Well, many organizations have a pretty hierarchical structure that determines who communicates with who. And computer networks often blow that apart because everybody exists as themselves and 
can meet each other across cultural barriers or barrier, barriers pertaining to profession and start to learn about whole new facets of activity. What makes the computer network really different to me than other organizations is the fact that it has the potential of many to many. In broadcasting, I think of it as a few to many. So there's only a few voices that are telling the many. Instead of having a voice just to the few who control the media, we've got a voice. All of us have a voice there. And I think that's a really, that feels more democratic. It feels like um, we can all say what we feel. There's room for all of our voices. The hierarchical structure is the thing that uh, artists sort of naturally work against. And uh, having the, uh, the leveling of the computer network uh, it levels the playing field. So you can uh, talk across class. You can cross uh, talk across culture, and uh, you're, you're not uh, uh, tied to a, a particular structure that, that uh, an organization generally develops. Uh, it, it's a lot wider. There's a lot more freedom. Ideally, um, I'd love to see lots of artists online and creating artistic projects. I think that one of the potential dangers of the construct of the information age is that we think everything is factual and non-biased information and that's a fallacy. There are many different ways of communicating and experiencing and, and knowing what reality is and I think that artists can help provide a different glimpse into what that is. Today I'm called a future, but if I don't change today, tomorrow I'm a historian. I'm often asked, how much faster can this uh, accelerating change we're going through now uh, go, and how long can it continue? Well, it can continue for quite a while. Uh, I now call the fast lane the slow lane. The new fast lane is the crystal lane, where everything moves at the speed of light. And those individuals, companies, and countries that can accelerate to that speed are going to be left behind in the land of the technopeasants. I think for anybody today that wants to learn about the information age, information is more accessible than it ever has been in the past. The cost is less. There's no social strata that prevents you from uh, getting access to this information. You may have to readjust some of your priorities. Instead of spending money on three cases of beer on a weekend, you may have to put that towards a second-hand computer or even rent a computer to learn uh, how to get into this age. I don't believe in information overload. I think we're only using 1% of our brain, and it's about time we started using the rest of it. For 18 years now, we've been monitoring satellite transmissions worldwide. We tape them and then watch them all and fast forward. So instead of seeing individual stories, we start seeing waves and trends. Many people uh, see this uh, Niagara of information as information overload, but I think we just have to uh, devise new ways of absorbing it and then disseminating it. These are the new virtual vision glasses. It's an advanced look at uh, what's coming in virtual reality. Wearing these, I can go about my uh, daily chores uh, while watching a television show or a, uh, parts of a book. I can read them on these glasses. We have certainly learned to uh, absorb information much more rapidly in the last century than man ever has in all preceding histories. Uh, 400 years ago, the most intelligent man on Earth only had the same amount of information as appears today in any single weekday issue of the New York Times. Today, that's just a drop in the bucket. <laughs> He doesn't talk about love, about 
politics, about all this information hasn't given him some incredible insight into anything. He talks about the subject of his, of his lectures or seminars is how there's so much information in the world um, and, and, and how there's going to be more information all the time. And that becomes the kind of content in the information age. You know, news at 11, you know, more, more of this. That's, that's a hell of a long step away from, from anything useful, anything that, 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 that will help us, you know, live out in a, in a satisfying way the 60 or 70 or 80 years that are all any of us um, get to have on this planet. Chaos is the most creative environment. As things start breaking down, then they can be reassembled in new ways, in a new uh, objects, in a new social uh, paradigm. The Chinese have a character for chaos. It means both danger and opportunity, or dangerous opportunity. I think in North America, we're seeing too much of the danger and not enough of the opportunity. And that's why today, uh, the Far East, as it used to be called, which today I call the Near West, is advancing much more rapidly than North America. Today you have to learn to live with uncertainty. You have to be able to go to bed with it. I tell people that to prepare for the future, you can do it through your palate. Start eating 50 different foods that you've never eaten before. You will find yourself thinking differently. The title of my first Gutenberg format book is The Last Book. And the reason for that title is because the age of literacy, as we've known it in the past, is coming to an end. Books are no longer economically viable to be manufactured. Uh, nobody's really making any money out of the books. Uh, even though there's been recently a proliferation of titles, uh, the average book in North America is only selling 2,500 copies. So uh, think of the implications of that. Also, all those books made uh, in the last roughly 150 years, and they're made with the process that uh, utilizes trees to make paper, they're made with acid and alkaline, and they disintegrate roughly after 100 years. 40% of all the books in libraries are now disintegrating to a considerable degree, and the libraries no longer have the budget to preserve them. The only way they can save them is to scan them digitally, and once they're in digital form, you don't need the books. So why do you need the library anyhow? It's now possible to put the entire Vancouver library on one 12-inch disc called a CIRODS, S-E-R-O-D-S. It stands for Surface Enhanced Raymond Optical Data Storage. Just think, one million books on one 12-inch disc. I don't believe technology is going to solve all the problems, but it's going to certainly uh, solve many of them. You have to understand a whole new game, and it's not like the old age. It's no, nothing soft and easy and just sitting at a desk. In fact, uh, you know, the office is really a 19th century concept that's coming to an end. All around me, coming to the studio today, I saw high-rise office towers. And I told Olympia and York ten years ago that what I saw in their high-rise towers was the raw material for the ghost towns of tomorrow. You need to know the new three R's. They're not reading and writing and arithmetic. They're ram, rom, and run. And if you don't know what that means, you're just as illiterate electronically and photonically as your parents or grandparents were in the past. Sometimes I'm asked, do I have any fears for the future? The answer is no. Uh, there will be disruptions. There will be more turbulence than we've had in the tranquil uh, last 50 years. Uh, but I see this all as leading to a better future. Uh, you don't get gain without some pain. And I think, especially in North America and Europe, we've become too soft because we've lived off our natural resources that are now no longer going to provide uh, the uh, uh, luxurious income and uh, lifestyle we've uh, experienced in the past. We're going to have to work much harder and continue to learn forever and ever. Every day is going to change so much that you're going to be in a new school whether you like it or not. You know, there's a bulldozer of change rolling over the planet. And if you don't become part of the bulldozer, quite likely you'll become part of the road.